Joining me is Yang Liang. She's a professor of economics at Willamette University. Thanks for, so much for your time. Now, as we've heard, growth in China is much less than in 2021 and short of Beijing's target of 5.5%. What are the main factors for this lag? Thank you, to talk, thank you for having me. Good to talk to you. So I think, first of all, um, the 3% is relatively low compared to China's historical average. But still, I think, you know, when you look at other countries in the world, um, the U.S. and the EU, they are forecasted to grow at below 3% and also coupled with high inflation. So I think China's economic growth is still stable. Um, and that slower growth rate compared to China's own history has to do, you know, two major factors. One has to do with the zero COVID policies. The policymaker is striking a very difficult balance between protecting people's health and lives and also maintaining economic growth. And there's also a very complex international environment. Um, there is a war going on um, and inflationary pressure, um, central bankers around the world tightening monetary policies and so on and so forth. So I think all these difficulties um, generated slower growth um, in 2022. But I think things are looking up. 2023 will witness a relatively strong and robust recovery for the Chinese economy. So now that restrictions have eased, when are we likely to see an impact, do you think? Right. I think we'll pretty soon to see a consumer demand picked up um, because, you know, the p consumer demand has been uh, pretty suppressed. People were not confident to go out to um, spend their money. Um, but from the recent data, when you look at, for example, spring uh, festival travel, there were estimated 2.1 billion trips um, to be made compared to last year's um, uh, 1 billion. So I think people are starting to um, spend, they're starting to recover from the peak of the infections. Um, they start to gain confidence. Um, also, one thing noted, uh, it's not, not, um, noteworthy, is that um, the Chinese uh, households have accumulated large amount of bank deposits, um, about $1.9 trillion uh, increase in their bank deposits in just nine months uh, last year. So there is a financial means um, for the consumer demand to pick up. And China's factories produce a greater share of the world's manufacturing output than the US, Germany and Jam Japan g combined. What might Chinese, the Chinese economic rebound mean for the US and also for the rest of the world? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, China's recovery would both boost the supply side and also demand side of the world economy. From the demand side, you know, China uh, will import a lot more. Um, nonetheless, uh, you know, not to mention, you know, for example, the uh, travels, uh, tourism, um, Chinese tourists spend about $250 billion abroad um, in the normal uh, non-COVID years. So we like to see that China's demand is going to pick up and that is going to strengthen the global demand as well. From the supply side, as you just mentioned, um, China maintained very stable and efficient supply chain. And so that could definitely help to produce uh, a lot more products for the rest of the world. And that would help to contain inflationary pressure and also improve supply chain efficiency. And with the nation's population shrinking, as we now know, how does that fare for China's long-term economic outlook? Yeah, that's a great question. I do think that uh, you know, demographic ch transition has posted uh, very tremendous sort of challenges to China. But again, I think um, there are also many policy measures that could be implemented, for example, on the supply side, again, to uh, compensate for the declining, you know, young labor force. Uh, we need to boost productivity. Uh, we need to reform the whole residency uh, policies. We need to improve the fertility rates by providing incentives, um, so on and so forth. And on the other hand, I think from the demand side, which is less mentioned, I think facing an aging population, the demand structure will change. So we will have to come up with policy measures to provide the kinds of the goods and services that the Asian population needs, like health care, like elderly community uh, care and housing, and so on and so forth. All right, Professor Yan Liang there. Thank you very much for your time.